The Three Strangest Things Prophets Did Number 1. Why did God tell Hosea to marry a prostitute? Hosea was instructed to marry a prostitute, which was as shocking then as it is now. Hosea chapter 1 verses 1 through 2. The Lord gave this message to Hosea son of Beeri during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam son of Jehoash was king of Israel. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. However, the story gets even worse. To understand this story better, we need to know about the time it happened. It was a time when things were going really well and there wasn't much trouble. Hosea was an important prophet in the Bible. His book is the first of 12 books about prophets in the Old Testament. He lived during a time when the kingdom was split into two parts after a big fight. This happened after King David and King Solomon, around 250 years later. Hosea's time was about 650 years after the Israelites first got the land they were promised. He talked to the people about God for a long time. When King Jeroboam II was ruling, Israel was doing great because they won a lot of battles. But even though things seemed good, people started acting badly. There was a lot of dishonesty and bad behavior. Instead of thanking God for their success, some people started to believe in a fake God named Baal. They stopped following God's rules, which was a big problem. The people of Israel turned away from God and started making deals with other nations instead. God saw this as betraying him, like cheating on a spouse. However, if you think this is strange, there are even stranger things that prophets have done. To know that, watch this video to the end. Now let us go back to the time of Hosea. They only cared about themselves and ignored what was right and fair. They were okay with breaking the rules and causing chaos. The leaders were corrupt too, taking bribes and making unfair decisions in court. Even though this happened a long time ago, about 2,700 years ago, it's similar to some things happening in the Western world today. In places like Bethel and Samaria, people did awful things in temples, thinking it would make God happy and give them good harvests. They even made a golden calf, which was against God's rules about making idols. God could have given up on them and started fresh with a new group of people, but he made a promise to the Israelites, like a marriage vow, and he wanted to keep it. However, he couldn't just ignore what they were doing and act like it wasn't happening. The first thing God told Hosea was about his own life, showing how God often works. Maybe Hosea would have preferred a message about someone else. But before a prophet can speak to others, they need to hear from God themselves. The message God had for Hosea wasn't easy. Hosea was told to marry a prostitute. Why? Because the people of Israel were like an unfaithful spouse, turning away from God. God used this command to Hosea to paint a clear picture found throughout the Old Testament. In this picture, the Lord is like a husband to Israel and their love for idols is like the unfaithfulness of an adulterer. They're as disloyal as a prostitute. This illustration helps us understand how our idol worship hurts God. When we prioritize anything above God, it's like betraying Him in a relationship. By telling Hosea to marry a prostitute, God wanted him to understand his pain firsthand. To illustrate Israel's unfaithfulness to God, Hosea married a prostitute named Gomer. Unfortunately, Gomer continued her unfaithful ways even after marrying Hosea. When she became pregnant, God told Hosea to give their children prophetic names that showed Israel's coming judgment. Hosea obeyed God's command and married Gomer, leading to the birth of their son, Jezreel. The name Jezreel meant God scatters, a warning from God about Israel's punishment. Hosea wouldn't have married Gomer if God hadn't told him to. His obedience to such a difficult command was impressive. However, Gomer didn't stop being a prostitute after marrying Hosea. He likely hoped she would change, but she returned to her old ways. It's possible they turned to prostitution out of boredom, neglect, or need. Sadly, these are the same unacceptable reasons people turn to idolatry instead of following God. Prostitution has been considered the oldest profession throughout history, even back in Bible times. However, the Bible sees it as a sin. 
Proverbs chapter 23, verses 27 through 28 says, A prostitute is a dangerous trap. A promiscuous woman is as dangerous as falling into a narrow well. She hides and waits like a robber, eager to make more men unfaithful. How could these two worlds mix and become one? Well, it would be a lesson that would teach many for centuries. Imagine what Hosea's neighbors thought when he married a prostitute, claiming God told them to do it. They might have doubted him, wondering what the real story was. But Hosea really did marry her because God commanded it. He became a prophet who gave Israel one last warning, repent and return to God or face his consequences. Hosea's story serves as a powerful lesson about obedience and God's mercy. Hosea chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. Soon Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, Name your daughter Lo-Rahamah, not loved, for I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. But I will show love to the people of Judah. I will free them from their enemies, not with weapons and armies or horses and charioteers, but by my power as the Lord their God. After Gomer had weaned Lo-Rahamah, she again became pregnant and gave birth to a second son. And the Lord said, Name him Lo-Ami, not my people, for Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. The name Lo-Ami, meaning not my people, was a constant reminder to Hosea and everyone else that the people of Israel had rejected God and were no longer considered his people. Since Gomer continued her prostitution, there might have been a cruel irony in naming their child Lo-Ami. It's possible that the child wasn't actually Hosea's, but someone else's. This would have added even more pain to Hosea's already difficult situation. God's message to Israel through Hosea was tough enough. But God also made Hosea live out this message in his own family life. It was a hard lesson about the consequences of turning away from God. Through the prophet Hosea, God accuses Israel of forsaking him to chase after prostitution, wine, and new wine. It's clear that both men and women were involved in idolatry, engaging in adulterous acts with cultic prostitutes as part of their worship of false gods. Gomer symbolized this idolatry because of the nature of the spiritual adultery that the people were practicing, which often led to physical adultery as well. Hosea prophesizes that God will remove the names of the false gods from Israel's lips and marry her to himself forever with righteousness, justice, steadfast love, and mercy. Throughout the Bible, adultery and prostitution are used as metaphors to describe people who are unfaithful to God. Many prophets depicted the people as spiritually unfaithful to God, to whom they belonged. Similarly, in the New Testament, similar language is used to describe spiritual unfaithfulness. Revelation chapter 17, verse 2. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. Despite the fact that God has promised judgment, the days of judgment will not continue on indefinitely. Following the day of judgment, there will be one that is filled with blessings, prosperity, and increased abundance. Hosea chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Yet the time will come when Israel's people will be like the sands of the seashore, too many to count. Then at the place where they were told, You are not my people, it will be said, You are children of the living God. Then the people of Judah and Israel will unite together. They will choose one leader for themselves, and they will return from exile together. What a day that will be, the day of Jezreel, when God will again plant his people in his land. God's promise would be fulfilled, but his judgment wouldn't last forever. Israel would eventually return to the Lord. And they would be called the sons of the living God again. The tragic marriage of Hosea serves as a powerful lesson about God's immense love for his people. Despite Hosea's deep sorrow over his unfaithful wife, Gomer, and her plans to return to her old life, God's love remained unwavering. Many people underestimate the seriousness of turning away from the Lord. Gomer's story after leaving Hosea's house shows how challenging life can become without God. To support their mother, Hosea appealed to his children directly, highlighting the pain of Gomer's departure. Hosea chapter 2, verse 5. Their mother is a shameless prostitute, became pregnant in a shameful way. She said, I'll run after other lovers and sell myself to them for food and water, for clothing of wool and linen, and for olive oil and drinks. It's like a scene from a movie, 
imagining Hosea on the day Gomer left, her suitcase packed and ready to go, not even saying goodbye to the kids. Many people drift away from the Lord because they're seeking satisfaction for their basic needs and desires, thinking they'll find it in the world. The devil is cunning, convincing people that they'll find happiness if they follow him into the world. But the truth is, turning away from the Lord doesn't bring lasting joy. The world may offer temporary pleasures, but it can't provide real happiness. Gomer's Fall This marks the beginning of Gomer's troubles. Initially, when she returned to her life of prostitution, things seemed to be going well for her. However, it becomes clear that she's headed down the wrong path. The Desperation of Gomer The celebration came to an end. Anxiety started to set in. Concerns intensified and then the feeling of regret set in. Hosea chapter 3 Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So, I bought her back for fifteen pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. And I said to her, You must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. This shows that Israel will go a long time without a king or prince, and without sacrifices, sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. But afterward, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord their God and to David's descendant, their king. In the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. The story mirrors the attitude of Jesus Christ towards the woman caught in adultery. Like Hosea, Jesus forgives, restores, and offers a new life of freedom to her. Hosea's actions also foreshadow how Jesus would one day redeem a sinful world through his own death on the cross. This prophetic book assures us of God's unchanging love for us. God's love is eternal and faithful, unlike human love, which can falter. God's love never wavers. Even when we are unfaithful, God continues to love and cherish us, always providing a way for reconciliation. It's fitting that Hosea's name means Yahweh has rescued or salvation, just like Joshua. Both names are related to Yeshua, which means to save in Hebrew and is translated as Jesus in English. This highlights the ultimate message of salvation and redemption in the story of Hosea. God used the lives of Hosea and his wife Gomer to teach a profound lesson to the entire nation. Hosea could have shown his people that Despite their unfaithfulness to God, he still loves and forgives them. Just as Hosea forgave Gomer and remained married to her. One commentator described Hosea's affection for Gomer as a beautiful equilibrium of loving tenderness and severe judgment. This dramatic portrayal illustrates the depth of God's love for us and how he redeems us from our unfaithfulness. Forgiving an adulterous spouse and welcoming them back home is not an easy act yet it symbolizes God's unwavering love and forgiveness. Regarding adultery, the Bible teaches that it's the adulteration of marriage by involving a third person. Adultery goes against the commitment made to God. The Bible begins with a story of a great marriage, emphasizing the importance of commitment and fidelity to God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Hosea could have judged his wife very severely. Under the old covenant law, given to ancient Israel under a theocracy, the punishment for adultery was death. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. It's crucial to recognize that in the context of adultery, punishment was equally applied to both parties involved. There was no double standard where men could escape consequences for their actions. They were held accountable alongside women. Often, individuals stray from their initial love and, in doing so, commit adultery. The book of Proverbs also provides insights into the character of an adulterer. Proverbs chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. He followed her at once, like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce its heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. These warnings should instill fear in anyone's heart. While the punishment for adultery in the Old Testament law might seem harsh, 
the spiritual consequences are even more severe. The story of Hosea and Gomer serves as a powerful illustration of God's unwavering love for his covenant people. Throughout the Bible, the theme of God's enduring love is consistent. The book of Psalms, in particular, provides numerous opportunities to express gratitude and appreciation for the Lord's steadfast love. Psalm chapter 36, verse 5. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Psalm chapter 13, verse 5. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. One of the most astonishing examples of unfailing love in the Bible is presented in the book of Hosea. As terrible as the acts of his wife was, Hosea forgave her. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39 reminds us, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is the faithful companion and our kinsman, Redeemer. He is the prophet who redeems his wayward bride. He is the father who patiently waits for his lost son. He is the one who joyfully welcomes home the prodigal son. Throughout history, those who have received His grace, endless mercy, and eternal love have been sinners who don't deserve it and are prone to wander from the right path and do wrong. We read sometimes that should also fill us with hope. Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me as the Lord. God's words to ancient Israel should fill us with hope today. Even though it may be difficult, we should see ourselves in the woman, Gomer. Despite the wrongness of engaging in prostitution, God is still able to forgive those who commit such immorality. The Bible tells us of Rahab, the prostitute, whom God used to fulfill his plan. Because she obeyed, she and her family received rewards and blessings. In the New Testament, a woman known for her immorality had the opportunity to assist Jesus while he stayed at a Pharisee's home. She acknowledged Christ's true identity and offered him an expensive bottle of perfume as a gift. Overwhelmed with sorrow and repentance, she poured the perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. When the Pharisees criticized Jesus for accepting the love of this immoral woman, he rebuked them and accepted her worship. Because of her faith, Jesus forgave all her sins, and she was welcomed into his kingdom. In order for Hosea to understand the emotions that God feels, God put him through a unique experience. Like other prophets, God often prepares them through their relationships or the lack thereof. For example, God told Jeremiah not to marry to show that God, too, experienced loneliness when Israel turned away from him. Similarly, Ezekiel was told that his wife would die, but he shouldn't mourn her to illustrate how God felt the loss of his people. Hosea's experience was also unique. God instructed him regarding his marriage, teaching him how he felt through this situation. Hosea found his wife, brought her home, courted her, and started afresh with her as his wife. An interesting detail is that Hosea's wife didn't realize that her blessings, like grain, new wine, and oil, came from God through Hosea, not from her lovers. The book of Hosea ends with a heartfelt plea from God, hoping that Israel would repent and delay the judgment. Unfortunately, Hosea didn't succeed in reconciling Israel to God. Their messages were ignored, and God had to carry out the promised judgment. Ultimately, Assyria defeated Israel in 721 BC, leading to their exile never to return. Number two, Habakkuk wrestles with Yahweh. Habakkuk's name means to wrestle or embrace, and he certainly grappled with significant concerns about the world and God's plan. He brought his questions directly to the Lord. Habakkuk's prophecy stands out among other prophetic literature in several ways. Firstly, most prophecies involve God speaking to the people through the prophet, but in Habakkuk, the prophet speaks directly to God, with no involvement of the people in the conversation. While this dynamic can be found in other prophecies, such as Jonah and Jeremiah, it's particularly striking in Habakkuk. Secondly, in chapter 2, 
the prophet is instructed to write his message on a wall in large letters. This method of communication is quite unique among prophetic literature. Lastly, chapter 3 of Habakkuk contains a prophecy set to music, which was relatively rare. Earlier leaders like Moses, Deborah, Samuel, Saul, Elisha, and David found inspiration in music for their prophetic words. And later, Ezekiel also used music in his prophecies. In this book, we delve into what Habakkuk says, sees, and sings. Through his experiences, we learn how to grapple with life's big questions. Habakkuk's turmoil, what he says. We're listening to a conversation between the prophet and the Lord. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Habakkuk started with a bold question. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. Even though I scream to you, violence, you will not save. Habakkuk was grappling with the twofold mystery of God's divine providence. He was perplexed by God's seeming inactivity. People were sinning, and God appeared to be doing nothing to stop it. Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 3 through 4. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Then he described Judah's transgressions and lamented the fact that wicked people seemed to have the upper hand. Justice was a hoax. God answered Habakkuk's question by saying, Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 5, The Lord replied, Look around at the nations, look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. Keep a watchful eye on the nations. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away. Like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. Oh, they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone, but they are deeply guilty, for their own strength is their God. Then God explained how he would punish his people for their transgressions by sending the horrible Chaldeans. Babylonians. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. O Lord my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out. O Lord, a rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow a people more righteous than they? Are we only fish to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? Then they will worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who have made us rich, they will claim. Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquests? God's response didn't ease Habakkuk's concerns. Instead, it seemed to raise even bigger questions about God's power and his seeming inconsistency. Lord, I'm puzzled, Habakkuk said. You're saying you'll punish your own people with a nation even more wicked than they are. What's going on? It's common for us to have similar questions when God's actions seem to contradict what we understand about his character. When faced with life's challenges, the first step should be to bring our concerns directly to God. He's not threatened by our honesty. Even Jesus on the cross asked why. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud, agonized voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Number two, Habakkuk's tower. What he sees. Habakkuk chapter two, verse one. 
I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Habakkuk then constructed a watchtower where he could stand on the rampart and observe. In ancient times, watchtowers were erected in fields to help guard the crops. Habakkuk was symbolizing his longing for a higher perspective. He would patiently wait to hear from God. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 Then the Lord said to me, Write my answer plainly on tablets, so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. God directed Habakkuk to inscribe his word in large letters, so that it could be easily read by all. In ancient times, public messages were often written on clay tablets and displayed in the marketplace. By doing so, God would answer Habakkuk's inquiries, and everyone would have access to his response. The initial message from God emphasized the importance of timing. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. God's actions may seem delayed, but we should have patience because His timing is always perfect. Since God is in charge, timing is crucial. We live in the shadow of two towering mountains, the mountain of birth and the mountain of death. Our existence is in the valley of time between those two points. God is fully in control of his plans, and we simply await his arrival. Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 9 through 19. What sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money gained dishonestly? You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. But by murders you committed, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the walls cry out against you, and the beams in the ceilings echo the complaint. What sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord of Heaven's armies promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but all in vain. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. What sorrow awaits you who make your neighbors drunk? You force your cup on them so you can gloat over their shameful nakedness. But soon it will be your turn to be disgraced. Come, drink and be exposed. Drink from the cup of the Lord's judgment and all your glory will be turned to shame. You cut down the forests of Lebanon. Now you will be cut down. You destroyed the wild animals, so now their terror will be yours. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. What good is an idol carved by man, or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. What sorrow awaits you who say to wooden idols, wake up and save us? To speechless stone images you say, rise up and teach us. Can an idol tell you what to do? They may be overlaid with gold and silver, but they are lifeless inside. Continuing through the chapter, we encounter four woe passages where God addresses sins prevalent in that culture and ours. Covetousness, violence, seduction, and idolatry. God assures that He will address these issues in His perfect timing. So, how should we spend our time while we wait? We should live by faith. This passage highlights two types of people in the world. The first type relies on themselves and believes they are saved based on their own merits and actions. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. The righteous shall live by his faith. It's a matter of trust. God was saying to Habakkuk and to us, the New Testament uses this verse three times. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, And my righteous ones will live by faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. 
Let all the earth be silent before him. But the Lord is in his holy temple, God declared. Let the earth be silent in his presence. That is the third and most crucial answer to life's questions. Even as worldly thrones and temples crumble, God remains in power. Nothing on this planet, no power, nation, or army can remove God from his throne. He reigns supreme. Just keep believing in him. Habakkuk's triumph, what he sings. We find a changed man here. Habakkuk has transitioned from wailing to singing, from gloom to glory, and from question marks to exclamation points. He began this writing in the valley and ended it on top of a mountain. What caused this change? Neither God nor Habakkuk's circumstances were to blame. Instead, Habakkuk had learned to trust in the Lord and was ready to sing. Notice the music terms all through the chapter. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 1. The prophet's prayer. Prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shagianoth. On Shagianoth, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. That's a musical expression. And as stated in the chapter's final sentence, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 19. The Lord God is my strength, my source of courage, my invincible army. He has made my feet steady and sure like hinds feet and makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence on my high places of challenge and responsibility. For the choir director on my stringed instruments, to the chief musician with my stringed instruments, that is, it should be used for congregational music accompanied by an orchestra. Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 3 through 13. God approaching from Sinai comes from Teman, Edom, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor and majesty covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His brightness is like the sunlight. He has bright rays flashing from his hand, and there in the sun-like splendor in the hiding place of his power. Before him goes the pestilence of judgment as in Egypt, and the burning plague of condemnation follows at his feet, as in Sennacherib's army. He took and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the eternal mountains were shattered, the ancient hills bowed low and collapsed. His ways are eternal. I, Habakkuk, in my vision, saw the tents of Cushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord's rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the Red Sea? That you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. Selah. You split the earth with rivers, bringing waters to dry places. The mountains saw you, and they trembled and writhed as if in pain. The downpour of water swept by as a deluge. The deep uttered its voice and raged. It lifted its hands high. The sun and moon stood in their places as before Joshua. They went away at the light of your swift arrows, at the radiance and gleam of your glittering spear. In indignation you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled and threshed the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation and rescue of your anointed people Israel. You struck the head from the house of the wicked to lay him open from the thigh to the neck. Selah. Selah appears three times in this chapter. A pause is a musical term as well. Some interpret it as, think about that. This is a song of prayer. Habakkuk was singing a plea to the Lord for revival. That is the ultimate cure to everything, revival. God is the one who fixes life's difficulties. God is the one who solves our society's problems. God knows the solution that the government does not. The answer is not found in social services, but in God. God is capable of sending revival. The next phrase refers to God coming down. The sentences that follow trace the steps of the children of Israel on their journey through the wilderness. The emphasis is on God coming down and being present throughout the entire journey. If God could do it in the past, He can certainly do it now. God is not changed or weakened in strength. We should be asking God to come down and bring revival to the world. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. Though the fig tree does not blossom and there is no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, Though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation in the victorious God of my salvation. 
This is a praise song as well. Consider how verses 17 and 18 are linked. Verse 17 begins with thou, whereas verse 18 begins with yet. Regardless of the circumstances, Habakkuk was saying yet. Regardless of what happens yet. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord, in the God of my salvation. That is the fourth response to the unresolved problems of life. Keep joyful in the Lord in all circumstances. Habakkuk then concluded by saying that God was his strength. Habakkuk didn't have all the answers, but he put his faith in his powerful God who did. Habakkuk was appointed by God to lead during tumultuous times. His name means to embrace, earned by wrestling with God at the beginning of his book and attaining intimate closeness with God by the end. The book could have been titled Leadership with No Easy Answers. Habakkuk pondered why God allowed Judah to continue in immorality and evil. He cried out to God but initially received no response. God seemed too tolerant for Habakkuk's liking. Finally, God revealed his plan to use Babylon to correct Judah's wrongdoing. This seemed preposterous to Habakkuk, who questioned God's wisdom. However, through this dialogue, he learned to trust and ended with a beautiful psalm of faith. Habakkuk teaches us to be praying leaders. The entire book is a dialogue between him and God, emphasizing the importance of interceding for the people before guiding them. Leaders must prioritize prayer and seeking God's guidance. Habakkuk also shows that it's okay to challenge God. We should have a close enough relationship to freely communicate our questions and seek guidance. Leaders must be humble enough to admit they don't know everything and seek God's wisdom. Finally, the most important lesson from Habakkuk is trust. He learned to trust God's wisdom even when he didn't understand. Despite uncertainties, he rejoiced and trusted in God's sovereignty. God's treatment of Habakkuk elevated him to a new level of leadership, and we can learn from this example. Number three, Moses disobeys God and strikes the rock. Moses played a significant role in the history of Israel as more than just a leader. He represented the Lord as Israel's lawgiver and leader, as the one through whom the Lord had liberated his people and revealed his covenant. When the people sinned against the Lord, Moses was filled with righteous anger and zeal for God's righteousness. He interceded on their behalf when the Lord threatened to destroy Israel because of their wrongdoing. Leading the Israelites for 40 years, Moses never hesitated to convey God's messages to them. As he approached the end of his life, he began to explain God's law to the people. This review was necessary due to the tragic historical context. Years earlier, at Kadesh Barnea, the Israelites had rebelled against the Lord and refused to enter the Promised Land. Consequently, God decreed that everyone from Moses' generation would perish in the wilderness for their lack of faith. The children of this generation needed to understand how their parents had failed to obey God and what God expected of them as they prepared to claim their inheritance. Restoring their commitment to God and His covenant was essential for their success in conquering the land and living in peace and prosperity. In reviewing the nation's history, Moses emphasized the importance of the Lord as their God. This God had redeemed Israel from Egyptian bondage, fulfilling His promise to their ancestor Abraham. He had chosen them and made a covenant with them, expecting their complete devotion to Him alone. When the Lord spoke to the Israelites at Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were given, He instructed them to leave and journey to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, along with their future descendants. However, while God had prepared the land for them, Israel still had to take possession of it. This underscores a crucial principle for believers today. While God always keeps His promises, obtaining those promises requires our obedience. We don't inherit God's promises while idly sitting by. Instead, we engage in loving, working, serving, praying, and fighting the good fight of faith according to our position in His kingdom. We follow our King's agenda, confident in His faithfulness to fulfill His promises. Though Moses was a faithful leader, he couldn't bear the burdens and disputes of the entire Israelite population alone. Therefore, Leaders were appointed for each tribe to assist him. The journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea was arduous for the Israelites, passing through a daunting wilderness. However, upon reaching the outskirts of Canaan, their spirits quickly soared. When ten scouts reported encountering giants in fortified cities, fear gripped the people, and they rebelled against the Lord, accusing him of leading them to their deaths. 
This audacious claim prompted the Lord to later testify against them. When Israel was a child, a young nation, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Despite God's tender and gracious provision for the people of Israel, they perceived his love as hostility. Moses endeavored to inspire the people by reminding them that the Lord would lead them into battle, just as he had done in Egypt and the wilderness. However, the Israelites' fear had rendered them blind and deaf to God's goodness. Sadly, they lacked trust in him, which incensed God to the point of swearing an oath that none from that generation would enter the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua, the two scouts who demonstrated faithful courage despite the obstacles, would inherit the land God had promised. Numbers chapter 14, verses 20 through 25. So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. But indeed, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my miraculous signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, will by no means see the land which I swore to give to their fathers, nor will any who treated me disrespectfully and rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valley. Tomorrow turn and set out for the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. Indeed, even Moses was not exempt from this dire consequence. He too was prohibited by the Lord from entering the promised land. Instead of speaking to a rock to make it yield water, as God instructed, Moses struck it with his staff. Numbers chapter 20, verses 2 through 11. There was no water for the people to drink at that place, so they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The people blamed Moses and said, If only we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers. Why have you brought the congregation of the Lord's people into the wilderness to die, along with all our livestock? Why did you make us leave Egypt and bring us here to this terrible place? This land has no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates and no water to drink. Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle, where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord said to Moses, You and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff, and water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. Indeed, Moses recounted this incident to the people before his death, not to absolve them of responsibility for his transgression, but to emphasize the contagious nature of their complaining, which ultimately led him to sin as well. As Moses' successor, Joshua, his faithful servant, would lead the people forward. The Israelites' refusal to enter the promised land on their initial opportunity, citing fear for their children's safety, became an ironic twist as God used their own excuse against them. In reality, they would be barred from entering the promised land and would perish in the wilderness, while their children would inherit it. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 34 through 40. When the Lord heard your complaining, he became very angry. So he solemnly swore, Not one of you from the wicked generation will live to see the good land I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. He will see this land because he has followed the Lord completely. I will give to him and his descendants some of the very land he explored during his scouting mission. And the Lord was also angry with me because of you. He said to Moses, Moses, not even you will enter the promised land. Instead, your assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, will lead the people into the land. Encourage him, for he will lead Israel as they take possession of it. I will give the land to your little ones, your innocent children. You were afraid they would be captured, but they will be the ones who occupy it. As for you, turn around now and go on back through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Recognizing their mistake, the people reacted to the sentence by foolishly attempting to conquer Canaan. They were thrashed because God was not on their side. They sobbed their way back to camp, 
but without any genuine repentance. God dismissed their prayers because of their rebellious hearts. That's a warning to all of us that he wants to be approached with sincere repentance and humility. Following the failure at Kadesh, God told the Israelites to turn back and head into the wilderness, where they wandered for the next few decades. It had already been well over a year since they had left Egypt. So from this point, the nation had to spend 38 years wandering around. Nonetheless, God had blessed Israel and kept an eye on them. Despite the fact that they were a population of over 2 million people meandering around in a vast wilderness, the Lord ensured that they had everything they needed for 40 years. Through this reference, Moses hoped to inspire trust in the incoming generation that, just as God had been true to their parents, he would also be faithful to them. Israel moved from Edom to Moab and got the same command from God not to offend the Moabites since they were the descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew. An extremely tall and impressive looking people tribe had formerly lived in Moab, but they had been pushed out. Moses then remembered God's command to cross Moab's Zered Valley. He reminded his audience that the entire generation of fighting men had not died of natural causes in the wilderness. On the contrary, the Lord's hand was against them, attempting to expel them from the camp until they were all extinguished. This is a somber reminder that no matter how healthy, affluent, or strong you are, if you rejoice the Lord's will, you will fail. His betrayal will be complete. If on the other side you surrender to his kingdom goal, his hand will be with you to support you in your situation. After God's punishment on the previous generation was carried out, Israel was ready to move forward in preparation for entering the promised land. They were to pass Moab's border once more, putting them close to Ammonite land. The Ammonite patriarch, Ben-Ami, like his half-brother Moab, was a son of Lot through his daughter. Moses had been barred from entering the promised land because he had disobeyed the Lord, but it appears that the heartening victories he had led in Transjordan gave him faith that God was willing to change his mind. Numbers chapter 20, verses 12 through 13. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed, trusted me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, you therefore shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, contention, strife, where the sons of Israel contended with the Lord, and he showed himself holy among them. Moses to die on Mount Nebo. And the Lord said to Moses that very same day, Go up to the mountain of the Abiram, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab opposite Jericho, and look at the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the sons of Israel as a possession. Then die on the mountain which you climb, and be gathered to your people in death, just as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people, because you broke faith with me among of the sons of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness 